Russell. I serve as pastor of the Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, and also the Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove, North Carolina. Whether you're part of our church family or you just found us on the net today, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And as we worship together, let me begin with just a couple of announcements. Our countdown is on. It's just two more weeks and, uh, from today until we meet together for the first time in over three months. We're excited about that. We're going to be coming together out in the church parking lot. Actually, it's going to be an outdoor service at 930 in the morning on the first Sunday in July, July 5th at Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church. You're invited. The uh, church address is on the screen and uh, you're more than welcome to call and ask for directions if you need to. Uh, we'll be meeting at 9.30 in the morning, which is our sister church's uh, normal meeting time. So we're meeting at 9.30, which is Mount Zion's time, on uh, Pleasant Hills parking lot. And uh, we can't wait for the exciting time of just getting back together again in our worship time. This coming week, Elizabeth and I will be away on a little bit of a vacation a break and so next Sunday we will not have a worship video. We have lots of uh, concerns on our hearts and uh, we'll be praying in just a few moments. Uh, lots of folks are still out of work uh, even though uh, it's getting better than it was. There are still so many that are unemployed and feeling a tremendous impact because of it. One of the things that has changed is for those of you who do bring food stuffs for CUOC, we've been asked to stop for the time being because uh, they have, uh, due to the virus and the way the government is distributing food stuffs, uh, they have received an overabundance from government supplies and they don't need any right now. And so they can't stock too much. Our worship today is from Matthew chapter 10. There's lots of uh, labels that are tossed around these days. Uh, two that we're very familiar with is, is liberal as opposed to conservative. Now there's political, there's theological, liberal and conservative. The church also has some labels. Uh, sheep and goats are um, in the book of Matthew, but there's also uh, liberal theologically and literal theologically question that we have this morning and that we'll look at in worship is, what's the problem with these labels? Uh, perhaps one of the most concerning questions about labels is, could you be labeled a church member or a disciple of Jesus? A couple of heads up. We'll have a children's message in just a moment, especially for them. So if you need to prepare, go ahead and hit that pause button and go get your coffee and your Bible. Open it up to Matthew chapter 10. And uh, when you get back, welcome. Our worship continues now with prayer and then our children's time. Father, we give thanks for your grace and kindness towards us. We live in a world that's sometimes difficult to navigate and our choices have so much impact on what kind of life we lead and whether you will receive glory and honor and praise from what we do. Lord, help us to gain clear vision and wisdom from your word today and from singing the songs and the simple knowledge that we're still connected by your spirit across the miles that separate us. Father, we used to pray that miles thing that separate us just about the missionaries or friends and family that lived in another state or another country. Lord, now we pray about the separation from our next door neighbor and the church family we long to see. And so, Father, we ask for your grace to cover our temptation to live in fear. We ask for your courage to live by your strength, not our weaknesses. Lord, we ask for steadfastness in our hearts and minds to turn from wickedness and embrace love. And we ask, Lord, for your compassion to be our compassion to share love with others. Father, we pray for our loved ones, our family, our friends, our fellow believers, and for those who serve and those who suffer around the world. Our list is always lengthy. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and in the hospital. We pray for those who are homebound and uh, in nursing homes. Lord, for the lonely, the despairing, those who are ailing, we pray your grace and your kindness and your healing. 
And Father, we pray your comfort today, particularly for the family of Kathleen Brown, who uh, passed away this week. Lord, may she rest in peace. May she rise in glory. In all things, O oh Lord, we ask for your blessing on the good choices that we make and for your correction in our human frail choices to turn the wrong way. Our lives are in your hands, O oh God, and we would trust and obey. With your good guidance, we will overcome the world, even as Jesus, our Lord, has overcome the world. And, Lord, and we pray the way Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hi kids, Pastor Russell back again. Do you have choices that you make? Of course you do, you have choices. Uh, starting when you get up every morning, you decide what you're gonna have for breakfast. You're gonna decide uh, after you eat breakfast whether or not you brush your teeth, I hope you do that. Um, you uh, make choices about what you'll put on. Maybe who you're gonna sit next to on the bus on the way to school. You have lots of choices to make. Some are not so important, others are pretty important. How do you decide what to do when something is a really important choice to make? Well, if you've got a decision that's coming up and it's really important, I would suggest that you go to the best source to find out how you should do it. And what I'm talking about, of course, is God's Word. The Bible has all sorts of information for us about everything that we really need to know in our lives. Sometimes we have to hunt but we will find it if we're diligent about it. Um, there's a verse that is very, very close to my heart. Matter of fact, it's a verse that I have trusted in virtually all of my life. Matter of fact, it's so important that in my Bible, I've underlined it and read and I've used a highlighter on there. It's found in the book of Proverbs, chapter three, verses five and six. Listen to this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Did you catch that? When you ask God, he's willing to help you to make a good decision. So how can we know more about decision making other than maybe all that information that's in the Bible? Well, in order to find out how to make decisions, how to make good decisions, you have to read this, you have to read your Bible. Uh, studying with others is also a big help. And that's why we have Sunday school. And that's why we have church with a sermon that's always based on the Bible. And uh, it's not a bad thing to study together as a group. You know, wherever you are, if you've got some friends, you can gather those friends together and you can talk about scripture and you can talk about what Jesus said. And even if it's a break in school, uh, maybe uh, on, on recess time or um, lunch time, if you want to gather and have a, a prayer with some of your Christian friends at school, there's nothing wrong with doing that. You can do that. Uh, you can ask your pastor. Your pastor is glad to help you find those passages of scripture. If you've got a decision to make, um, your pastor's glad to help you. Mostly though, you should be praying as well. Read God's word and pray, ask God to teach you, uh, and then decide that whatever God teaches you, that's what you'll do, you'll obey. The Apostle Paul wrote a lot of the New Testament. He was uh, somebody who knew an awful lot about God, loved God, loved Jesus, and uh, he taught a young man by the name of Timothy, who was going to be a pastor, he taught Timothy an awful lot about how the Bible is so important to help him make decisions as a pastor, and that works for us as well. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 2.15. 
Paul wrote to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one who is approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word of truth. Word of truth, God's word, the Bible, all different phrases for the same thing, God's letter to us to tell us how to make our decisions so that we'll be pleasing in his sight and we'll have a decent life. Well, let's pray together and let's ask God to help us to learn to use God's word well. Lord, we would be like Timothy. We would use your word well and find out that uh, you really do like it when we do that. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to study your word. Help us to read it often. Help us to discuss it with our friends and with our pastor and with our Sunday school teacher and with uh, those who are in our classes and in our church. Lord, we want to be good disciples, strong disciples, people who know what you want to do. Father, we are loving you today and we thank you for loving us back. And as we continue to worship, we pray that you'd bless us. Open our hearts, Lord. We hear you in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next time.
Our message this morning is entitled, The Struggle of the Surrendered Life, and it comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verses 24 through 39. We'll read those parts of the scripture as we come to them during this time of study. There are labels, as I said at the outset of the service, there are labels that the church has. There's literalism, which means taking the word of God very literal in every sense, just exactly what it says. And then there's liberalism. And that's kind of adding man's thoughts into it. Literalism, liberalism. There's a problem with both sides of that. There's a whole subset of Christianity here that takes the claims of Christ to a level of legalism. These are the literalists, if you will. Uh, they take uh, the claims of Christ, the word of God, to a level of legalism, which is kind of like a stubborn child in the household who just wants to push the envelope. Of course, you don't know what having like one of that is. Um, kind of stirring the pot all the time, making a household a living hell, literally, with tension, accusations, and constant bickering. What that is is nothing more than an excuse to live in chaos and not live in peace. For clarity, we would call the literalists modern-day Pharisees, always questions, always finger-pointing, saying, no, 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 that's not the way Jesus said. There's a corresponding subset of Christians or Christianity that is 180 degrees polar opposite of the literalists. These, instead of pushing the envelope, fold the envelope, tuck it away in the dusty family Bible that is sometimes brought out when the minister comes to visit. Well, this group holds almost no conviction whatsoever about sin, uh, other than to say, who are you to judge me? Again, uh, Clarity would label this group the Corinthian Church of the Modern Day Saints. <laughs> well, in the absolute middle of this fringe comparison are those who would rather skip the drama altogether and head for the fields, which are, as Jesus said, ready to be harvested. If you've never read that, it's in John chapter 4, verse 35, where Jesus said, there's four months between planting and harvesting, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already white unto harvest or ripe for harvest. Jesus was talking about the hearts of mankind. That's what the harvest is. He said, have them come to me, bring the harvest to me. So there is a, there's a phrase that was given to me the best three words that I ever really heard about, um, about living, really, and about uh, dealing with the tension between literalism and liberalism. And that phrase is this, let it go, let it go. It's the best and most important advice I ever got. Now, that phrase is not to be confused with giving up. No, life is too precious and too important a gift from our creator God to give up caring or loving or working for the greater good. But life is way too short to hold on to toxic dreams and arguments and things that don't last longer than a news cycle. It's better to hold on to that which is eternal. So let's dig in a little bit further. Let's unpack this. Why not literalism? meaning there's no error in scripture. We ought to obey it just absolutely every single word. Well, the problem is not scripture because it's just the opposite. Scripture is all truth. There is no error. There's nothing wrong with scripture. What's wrong is sometimes our problem of getting scripture wrong. We misinterpret it. That's what makes literalism so dangerous. A man, for instance, who reads in the scripture, let the women be silent in the church, and takes it literally, meaning women can't speak, they can't teach, they can't do anything, they make a mistake about God's sense of equality. And there are legions of examples how misinterpretation of God's word happens. There's a basic flaw in choosing literalism because it enrolls you in the holiness police where you make sure that everybody obeys every jot and tittle of the law and the prophets and it instructs you to point out every flaw that other people have. No, no, it's too easy to wind up with an oak tree in your eye looking for splinters in somebody else's eye. Now that's Jesus' illustration of somebody who 
uh, thinks everybody else is wrong and they're the only ones that are right. But on the other end of the spectrum, why not liberalism? Meaning Christ set us free and the laws of scripture have been neutralized so I can do what I wanna do. Again, the problem is the same as literalism's error, misinterpretation. An objective reading of all scripture shows us that Jesus did not die to set us free so that we can just do what we want to do. Christ died and rose again to set us free so that we would be able to do what we ought to do, which is to love and serve and worship the God who created us. We can't do that and live in sin at the same time. Salvation requires a change, a difference from this world's culture. So on the one hand, we have literalism. Um, Got to do it just exactly as the Bible says, which means do it the way the Bible says, the way I think the Bible says. And then there's liberalism and it says, nobody can tell me anything. I'm going to live the life the way I want because Jesus set me free. Those are the extremes of biblical living uh, where you interpret it so tightly that nobody can move. And the other is that you just about throw it away. You fold up the envelope and tuck it into the dusty family Bible. The basic flaw in liberalism is becoming a liberalist Corinthian hedonist. <laughs> Corinthian church was steeped in flagrant sensual sinning and worldly culture. Everything that the world thought, well, that's what they thought. That's good, I'll try it. The liberalist Corinthian hedonist says, sin, what do you mean sin? There's no such thing. Jesus died to make me free. That means I can live my life the way I want to. And if you can't set me, accept me the way I am, then you're the one with the problem. Did you catch that the basic flaw in both fringe extremes of Christianity, literalism and liberalism, is neither understands that that's not what Jesus came to die for. It's not that there's no such thing as sin. Jesus' incarnation was all about our depravity and how we need salvation, how we need for him to die for us. But without the cross, God would have no choice but to condemn us all to hell. There is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, and in particular, the shedding of Christ's blood on the cross. And it's not that there's no such thing as freedom in Christ either. Either if he, if he offered anything less than release from bondage, we'd be slaves to sin forever in this life and in eternity. And that's not God's plan either. So the meaning of the cross and the plan of Jesus' sacrifice is truly and so overwhelmingly about freedom from sin so that our relationship with the Father can be restored. We're set free to be his children not just by DNA, being born into a Christian family, or with total license to sin with impunity, but rather set free to love and to serve and to worship the one who loves us. He loved us enough to die for us. And while the act of Jesus dying for us, taking our sin debt, is the singularly most powerful act of love in the universe and freely offered to us, there is a price we pay for picking up that cross. Salvation is offered free, but beyond that free offer of grace for our salvation to be forgiven, there is an expectation on God's part that we will pick up that cross. We will follow after Jesus. It's not just a one-time transaction and it's done and it's over with and See you later, Jesus. I'll see you when it's time to go to heaven. No, it's a daily relationship. So what about this cost? What cost really is there of choosing the surrendered life? Well, I think there are three problematic hurdles associated with the cost of picking up the cross. For everyone who chooses the name, the name of Jesus Christ and picks up the cross is going to face these three hurdles. Hurdle number one is discipleship. That doesn't sound so ominous to be a, a disciple of Jesus, to be a learner of Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 24. Students are not greater than their teacher. By the way, that's what a disciple really is, is a student sitting at Jesus' feet, learning of him. 
Students are not greater than their master and uh, than their teacher, and slaves are not greater than their master. Students are to be like their teacher, and slaves are to be like their master. Do you recall the old saying that if you lay down with the dogs, you're going to get up with the fleas? Well, that is a very true saying. <laughs> Trust me, I know. <laughs> Uh, but the flip side of that is also true. To lay down with the dogs is kind of a, a bad thing. We do it because we want to do it. We want to get next to the dog, play with the dog. We get up with fleas. Why? Because you got close to the dog. You hung out with the dog. The flip side is also true about goodness. If you give yourself to the Christ who is entirely without sin, you're going to be transformed into his image a person of worth and goodness, a lover of truth, a person who cares about God and also about people. Scripture tells us that hanging out with Jesus will change us. And that's what discipleship is intended to do, to create in you and me, to conform us, the scripture says, to the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29 says it this way, for God knew his people in advance and he chose for them to become like his son. That's God's choice is for you and for me. If we're committed to be disciples, if we're committed to discipleship, to be transformed into, conformed to the image of Christ. This is a scriptural foundation for discipleship, for studying God's word together. Some people think Sunday school or Bible study is for children. I'm here to tell you it is. It's for the children of God, no matter how old they are or when they came to Christ, it's for the children of God. When you participate in Bible study, the purpose is not to build the attendance role for bragging rights. It's about bringing disciples to a maturity level that will please God and serve God and change and transform the world for Jesus Christ. So this is hurdle number one of actually being a disciple of Jesus, not just saying you're a disciple of Jesus, because a disciple will join with other believers to become stronger disciples, stronger believers through the study and the implementation of God's word in their lives. You hang out with Jesus, you become like Jesus. In case you missed it, that means don't ditch Sunday school. Don't go to worship and don't stay for the Bible study. Or don't ditch going to Bible study early in the morning and then going to worship. You need both. You need worship. You need Bible study. Because if you're a part of the body of Christ, you need discipleship. And the more the merrier. If you need discipleship just like a fish needs an ocean to swim in. Hurdle number one, discipleship. Become a disciple. Hurdle number two is declaration. That has to do with becoming a witness. Starting at verse 25 uh, in Matthew chapter 10, we read this about declaration. Jesus said, and I, since I, the master of the household, have been called the prince of demons, the members of my household will be called by even worse names. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed or declared and all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They can't touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What's the price of two sparrows? One copper coin? But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid, for you are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges, here, here comes the declaration part now. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Living the surrendered life is a struggle. There's no question about it. Living a surrendered life, a life of doing Jesus' will and not my will, it is a daily surrender to getting comfortable with being a servant. A servant doesn't do what he wants. A servant complies with the will of his master, no matter what the rest of the world thinks about him. 
There are those who imagine being a Christian is a matter of, well, going to church and writing out a check to the church, attending the worship service, serving on a committee of fast. Well, I want you to know that those things are kind of the perks of being a Christian. They don't define being a Christian, but they don't define the hurdle here of declaring Christ with everything that you do, of being his witness, of declaring for Jesus and declaring who Jesus is. Did it click in yet, that thing about acknowledging or denying Jesus in this life and having him acknowledge or deny you in the next life? This is the declaration hurdle issue of Jesus' words in Matthew 10. Jesus gives us words of warning, and he also gives us marching orders in the same paragraph. The warning is, if you deny me here, I'll deny you in heaven. And the marching orders are, whatever I've told you, shout it from the housetops. Whisper it in everybody else's ear. Don't hold back. We are not to be afraid of those who can kill the body because our eternal souls are in his hand. We must not be timid or shy about speaking out for Christ. That's where the declaration takes place, at home first with our loved ones and then everywhere in public, whether it's at school or a job or meeting friends for a beer or playing softball or fishing together or going to the grocery store. Our witness is to be clear, as clear as Jesus said to the disciples, to not hold back anything when it comes to sharing the faith. I've heard some people defend why they don't share their faith, because they're concerned that they might mess it up, or somehow scare the person, or offend the person into never accepting Christ. They'll, they're afraid that they'll chase them away from Christ. There are two thoughts I have about this. First, I think that's just nothing but an excuse for being timid. And it denies Christ here on earth. Guess what that means? That means Christ will deny you in heaven. If you fail to declare him as your savior and your Lord here on earth, you are asking for him to declare in heaven that he never knew you, to depart from him. The second thought I have is even if it were possible to mess up your testimony, and that's what declaration is. It's testimony of how you came to Christ, what Jesus means to you. That's what a witness does. You know, in the court of law, when they put the man on the stand and they swear him in, he's going to be a witness. What did they ask him to do? Tell in exact terms what you saw, not what somebody else saw, not what you learned in school, what you saw. And so being a witness for Christ is not a matter of being able to expound on all sorts of theological arguments and win the theological debate. Being a witness of Christ is telling somebody else how you as a beggar found the bread. <laughs> what Christ means to you because of how you came to him and why you came to him, you tell your own story. Now, even if you could mess up that story, where are you going to scare off this non-believer to? Hell number two? <laughs> I mean, he's already headed for hell number one. And you know, the lost really do go to hell. You do know that. The question is, do you care about that? So we have two hurdles, first of all, our discipleship and our declaration, both for Christ. And then hurdle number three is division. Now, we begin in verse uh, 34 through 39, when Jesus talks about division. He says, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. Well, wait a minute, isn't he the Prince of Peace? Yes, stay tuned. He said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. If you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Now, if you make it past those first two hurdles, discipleship and declaration, discipleship, learning about Jesus, declaration, telling other people why you came to Jesus, how Jesus loved you and how Jesus forgave you, what Jesus has done to make changes in your life. 
you make past those first two hurdles, you will have grown substantially enough so that you understand this third one about division. The hurdle of division is one of those largely unpublished realities of the Christian church. We talk a lot about unity, which is the opposite of division, but that unity business is supposed to be unity among the family members within the church. Those who have committed their lives to Christ. This is the definition of the surrendered life. It's accepting the struggle of putting self on the back burner and elevating Christ in your life. When you talk about the church, this is what heaven expects, not people who like music and, and socializing, but they have little time or little appetite for worship, work, and witness. They don't want to know anything about discipleship, about studying the scriptures with others. They don't care about if the church falls apart or not. They don't care to openly share their witness and bear the brunt of perhaps ridicule. The problem is that there are so many goats among the sheep in the church that it's a given that there will be division. Now, I'm not going to point fingers and say who's to blame here, but it's my belief that it is primarily a failing of leadership, either by pastors, the clergy, if you will, the professional church people, like myself, or lay leadership, because we want to see the church grow. We want to get members in the church, so we do a terrible thing, a terrible injustice, not only to the Lord, but an injustice to the people we speak to. We lower the entry bar of what Christ requires just to get new members in the door just to see the numbers grow. The fact is, if more people understood the claims of Christ from the get-go, including their presence, their prayers, their worship, their gifts, their stewardship, their service, if people understood the claims of Christ on their life, fewer people would actually join the church. I mean, fewer than now. But the church would correspondingly have a lot less strife and bickering in it. Because when you know the difficulties, when you know the claims of Christ, when you know what is expected of a believer, somebody who has come to salvation in Christ and is now a disciple of Christ, discipleship, learning, declaration, sharing, and then understanding that division is a mark that somebody's not right with Christ. Christ did not die a horrible criminal's death on Calvary so that we would all gather around the campfire to sing Kumbaya and feel all warm and fuzzy. When Jesus Christ was crucified, it was the culmination of the fiercest spiritual battle anyone has ever encountered. He suffered that cruel death so he could rise over it and make eternal life a reality for us. I want you to hear once again the words of Jesus. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Jesus says that these divisions were the result of his mission. But you also have to know that this is not something that Jesus relished or even wished for. It's said, these words are said with a sigh of resignation. It's like Jesus is saying, I didn't come to bring peace. People are going to be divided over who I am. People are going to be divided over how to act. People are going to be divided over what the kingdom really is all about. They're not going to understand discipleship is required. They're not going to understand that their declaration of love for me is required. They're not going to understand, and there's going to be a division. Very much like the words Jesus spoke over Jerusalem. There were words of sadness and heard about how he would have loved at all times to open up his arms and gather together Jerusalem's inhabitants like a mother hen gathers her chicks underneath her. But they refused. They would not. 
They rejected Christ. This is a picture of human nature, even in this day. Some people believe and they place their faith in Christ for salvation. They accept the surrendered life as a servant of God. Others choose the goat life. They want nothing to do with Christ or serving anybody but themselves. They join the church because they see some sort of benefit. They think, well, if they do that, they'll get their Christian neighbor off their back. The only common areas of life with sheep and goats in the Lord's kingdom is sometimes they're in the same family. A son follows Christ, becomes a disciple, becomes a declarer, understands the division when his father turns his back. Mother loves the Lord, the daughter is angry and rejects God altogether. There are enemies in the same household. You've seen that, perhaps experience it in your own family. Our Lord's word do not drop to the ground. Our Lord's words come true. And so it's a struggle, this life of surrender to serve Christ. But it is more than worth it. Here's the Apostle Peter's summary of the whole matter of living the struggle. It's found in 1 Peter 5.10. Peter wrote, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while through the divisions, he will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your kindness in calling us close to your side, to hear your hearts beating, to sense your love, covering us like a lovely fragrance. May our discipleship draw us closer to you. May our declaration of the gospel to friends and family and strangers draw them closer to you. Living with the division of sheep and goats, keep us ever mindful of how you do not take any pleasure in the de death of the wicked, but you're willing to empower us to reach this world with the good news that eternal death is not necessary for any who would turn to the cross and be saved. For the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to honor and lift up the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives. Amen. Our final song is part of our discipleship, our commitment to serve Christ. It is part of our declaration to share him with others. It is part of recognizing that there is division in the world and we're gonna do something about it. Here I am, Lord, here I am.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. It's a joy for us to be able to share Christ in this way. Don't forget two weeks from today, our first open air worship and the address is on the screen. And so is the number to call if you need directions or more information. God bless you is our prayer this week.